Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. So, we were talking about the combustion chamber inside a gas turbine engine and um, inside an aero gas turbine engine and as we have seen that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that of course, it com contains of several components which are uh, which has to be designed in a very precise manner and which has to be designed in an integrated manner because as you have seen that the first component inside the combustor is your diffuser and that diffuser has to be designed so that it can divert the flow. Uh, in the required proportions into the into the dome region of the combustor into the primary zone as well as it can provide enough air in the same required proportion inside in the exactly the same amount that it is desired into downstream region of the combustor which is called the dilution zone. So, we have essentially three zones as you have seen the primary zone the uh, where the main combustion takes place the intermediate zone uh, which uh, increases the combustion efficiency and reduces pollu pollution and then the dilution zone. Okay. And we have seen what are the requirements of the primary zone and this is how essentially the different kinds of uh, so flames in the dilution uh, in the in the primary zone should look like because in the primary zone what you have is essentially you have a you have the injector the liquid fuel injector and on uh, the liquid fuel injector is surrounded with the solar blades okay, which provides that tangential momentum on to the otherwise axial flow. Okay. Now, why do you need this uh, tangential momentum because when you have this tangential momentum then uh, what happens is that of course, um, due to the, the, the centrifugal forces the, the flow essentially diverges and essentially when the flow diverges under when the swirl number or the, the, the tangential momentum is sufficient the flow can essentially recirculate. Okay. So, when it recirculates essentially what you what you do is that what you are actually doing by, by making the flow recirculate is that you are increasing the residence time of the flow. And if you remember that in the in the in the earlier uh, uh, discussion on the limit phenomena the S curve that the dam coulomb number that is which is the ratio of the flow time scales to the chemical time scales that should be substantially high for steady combustion to take place. Okay. If it is small it can you first of all you will not be able to ignite the, the mixture and uh, then even after you ignite if it becomes uh, small in certain cases after ignition then it will extinguish. So, to have steady combustion which is pretty much required because if there is no steady combustion inside the gas turbine combustor then you have basically no source of power right. You do not have the chemical to thermal energy conversion taking place. So, you must have steady combustion inside the combustor at all times and to ensure that you your uh, your, your flow should not be at a such a high velocity that there is it is not enough for the chemical reactions to take place. So, this is the very important and the very basic principle of a combustor design that the residence time of the flow must be greater okay, than the corresponding chemical time scales which means that the dam color number should be high. So, to make the dam color number high you employ this recirculation in certain cases you can employ a bluff body also as you will see later that in a typically in an after burner uh, or the augmenter we people use uh, bluff bodies, but uh, in the main combustor which we are discussing right now okay, you essentially use this kind of uh, swirling flows. And here the swirling flows is characterized by the swirl number which is the axial flux of azimuthal momentum divided by the axial flux of axial momentum. Okay. So, these are the uh, different uh, the different types of swirling flows in laboratory combustor. Of course, uh, you have to understand that uh, that in a real gas turbine engine where the Reynolds number is of the order of turbulence, turbulence Reynolds number if the, is of the order of 50,000 then uh, of course, the flow is swirling, but it is also intensely turbulent. Okay. So, the, uh, the flame essentially resides in a swirling turbulent flow okay. and then there are minimum things can happen there can be non-linear feedback uh, there can be feedback between heat release and pressure fluctuations and these you know, there uh, if they are in phase then this can lead to instabilities. So, those are important uh, things to be looked at, but in this course we will not go into uh, uh, thermoacoustic instabilities because that is a very involved uh, thing itself and uh, there are other NPTEL courses you can take a look um, uh, for if you are interested in the thermoacoustic instability. So, in this course we will not cover that. So, uh, then uh, 
in the intermediate zone uh, uh, you have to essentially uh, ensure that the complete uh, uh, combustion uh, 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 takes place and um, uh, so the intermediate zone essentially provides enough air in combustion chamber to decrease the temperature and burn the carbon monoxide and hydrogen and uh, uh, but uh, typically I mean in modern combustor you go straight into the dilution zone and this is the dilution zone you see uh, here what I is, is uh, this, this picture depicts ex exactly what I was talking about that uh, the whole combustor should be designed in a very uh, integrated manner that is you see the diffuser you have to design it in such a way so that that uh, the the the, uh, the 20 percent of the air is only going into the uh, combustor of course this uh, this actual number can differ for different combustors this is just typical numbers and out of that 20 percent 12 percent goes to the solars these are the solars and then 8 percent goes into the, the to the surroundings and then for cooling purposes whereas the 80 percent of the main air okay which comes out of the uh, which uh, uh, which exits uh, the uh, the 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 compressor and uh, actually uh, or or there can be it can also be the bypass air it need not be only or always come out of the compressor so um, the 80 percent of the total mass flow rate of the air uh, uh, that comes into the um, uh, combustor is essentially diverted to the cooling for cooling purposes which enters out of that 20 percent of that enters the um, uh, 20 percent of that of the full uh, air enters into this primary zone for cooling and then later it 20 percent enters into the dilution zone okay and uh, so first uh, we need to essentially uh, focus uh, 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 here that this this purpose of this dilution air is that um, the exhaust that get out of the combustor is given a specific temperature profile before it enters the turbine and this temperature profile is is uh, comes from uh, uh, st structural considerations of the turbine blades um, okay so that uh, the material the because the turbine blades are under immense centrifugal forces because they are rotating at so high velocities and uh, uh, not only they are under centrifugal forces they are under both centrifugal as well as high thermal uh, stresses okay so uh, to circumvent that your temperature and to maximize the life of the turbine blades of course the turbine blades are one of the most expensive component uh, of the um, of the of the entire engine they have to be really manufactured uh, in, in the manufacturing them is a, one of the most difficult challenges inside the gas turbine engine and as such um, uh, then uh, of course your uh, as a com as an engineer your uh, uh, your focus should be to design the turbine blades in such a manner that their life is maximized and to ensure that their lifetime life is maximized you have to ensure that the temperature profile that this turbine blade sees uh, average temperature profile and the fluctuating temperature profile that this turbine blade sees uh, they are exactly designed so as to minimize the thermal stresses okay or to optimize which are uh, you provide them a temperature profile which will maximize their life okay and this profile is known as a pattern factor and this dilution zone this cooling is essentially achieved uh, is, is, uh, is designed to achieve a particular pattern factor and essentially as you see the 60 percent of this air is used in here okay so this uh, this is the uh, this is the 60 percent 40 plus 20 uh, 60 percent that is used for achieving that thing now uh, uh, then we uh, go into uh, go into the details of the primary zone okay uh, we need to go into the some some details about the primary zone and uh, essentially let us see what uh, happens inside the primary zone okay now as if you remember that the one of the most important goals okay um, uh, one of the, or one of the most important uh, reasons why combustion is used in gas turbine engines is because of the immensely high energy density of the liquid fuels right liquid kerosene uh, or its variants jta1 jta different types of different types of the this this variants of kerosene are essentially used in the uh, used in the combustion chamber which is the complete fuel source so kerosene is the optimized fuel for gas turbine engines okay and of course there the, the reason we don't use a battery in a in a in, a, in an aircraft uh, in a large aircraft and we use a, a use fuel uh, liquid fuel is because of the very high energy density of the liquid fuels fine we understand this but you see there is you cannot just burn the liquid fuel directly inside the gas turbine combustor okay you just cannot have because in gas turbine combustors or the score so far we have seen we have only talked about reactions in gas phase in the gas turbine combustor also even in though we use liquid fuels the combustion reactions 
strictly happens in the gas phase. Okay. They do not happen in the liquid phase. There are examples of reactions happening in the liquid phase. For example, uh, if you talk about rocket engines where you use uh, like uh, uh, MMH and uh, uh, RFNA uh, for your fuel oxidizer, uh, their re reactions can happen in the liquid phase where which are called the hypergolic uh, reactions. Uh, okay. But in a gas turbine engine, in air breathing engines, in gas turbine engines, in afterburners, in scramjets, ramjets, everything, typically when you use a liquid fuel, reactions must happen in gas phase. This is absolutely the uh, always, it is absolutely what happens in uh, all occasions. So, you have a tank of a liquid fuel which you are carrying and then in the combustion chamber, you are basically uh, sending out the liquid fuel in some form. Okay. But so, one important process is basically how you convert these liquid fuels into gas phase so that this liquid fuel in the gas phase can mix with the oxidizer which is the air and then combustion can happen. Okay. Now, you will ask that what is the problem? Okay. I can I will send out the liquid fuel and it will burn and then it will, I will allow it to vaporize or evaporate and it will burn. Okay, and then we can have it the, the create a fuel and mixture and then we can get it burning. The problem is that the time available in the combustor is not large, it is very short. Okay. So, what you need to do is that we have to design a process by which we can send the liquid fuel into the combustor and it can con get converted from the liquid to the gas phase to the vapor phase of that fuel very quickly and in the vapor phase it can mix with the air and then it can burn. Okay. How do you achieve that? You cannot have, uh, uh, you, we cannot just rely on the process of uh, evaporation. Okay. So, what we need to do is that this liquid that is stored in the fuel tank, we need to basically increase the surface area of this liquid to the maximum possible surface area. Okay. How can you achieve the maximum possible surface area? If you can somehow convert this liquid in the tank to very, very small droplets. Okay. Because as you know in the droplets, droplet surface area by uh, uh, droplet surface area by volume is equal to 4 pi r square divided by 4 third pi r cube. Right. So, uh, this cancels. So, then this goes by 3 by r. Okay. So, as radius decreases, the surface area to volume ratio increases. So, for a given volume, you can have maximum surface area if you if your radius is very small. Okay. And then of course, we know that uh, then this will lead to very fast evaporation also. Okay. So, you need to increase the surface area. So, for that you need to make very, very small droplets. How do you make very, very small droplets? And that is the process basically what is called the liquid jet breakup and atomization. So, in this primary zone apart from combustion, you have to have a very important process which is the droplet, the liquid jet breakup and atomization. Okay. So, this is what we are going to study. So, but you recap that also we need a small droplets because if you remember that the drip droplet vaporization time, okay, this droplet vaporization time was essentially proportional to the initial droplet radius divided by this. Uh, 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 droplet vaporization uh, uh, constant okay. and it was given by this thing. It was given by this constant k v was essentially given by this thing. Okay. But all these properties lambda by C p liquid uh, so rho by, by rho l times ln uh, 1 plus b droplet heat transfer number with all these things you see that smaller the droplet smaller is the evaporation time and it goes like squared. So, if you reduce the size of your droplet by 10 times, the time for evaporation reduces by 100 times. Okay. So, the purpose, uh, the, 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 a very important uh, function of the liquid injector inside a gas turbine combustor is to produce droplets of very, very small size. The ultimate product of this thing is that I will take the liquid, I will, I will, I will connect this injector to my liquid uh, tank in such a manner, in some manner and then I will make some arrangements so that this injector can spray and can send out these liquids and they can create a, a mist of very, very small droplets. Okay. But how does that happen? 
So, this is also a very important fundamental part of a gas turbine combustor and we are going to look into that. And even if the droplet burns, once again as you know that combustion happens in the gaseous phase, the time for uh, droplet uh, combustion is also proportional to R the initial radius squared okay, divided by Kc, where this is the droplet uh, burning constant. Okay, this is the droplet uh, 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 combustion constant, which is also proportional to this thing, kind of thing. So, this is lambda by Cp divided by rho liquid times ln of 1 plus b uh, 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 hc. Okay, so, the droplet uh, b uh, b heat transfer number for combustion. So, this is the thing. So, it is imperative that you produce very, very small droplets inside the combustor. So, for that to understand that uh, we are we are fortunate in one sense that uh, uh, that the, this uh, even if we send out a liquid jet, the liquid jet is not a very stable configuration. Okay, a liquid cylindrical jet is not the stable configuration because of I will show that that the uh, liquid jet tends to to minimize the surface energy. Okay, to is essentially tends to form small droplets. But that droplets are not, uh, it tends to form droplets which is proportional to your, to the radius of that jet. Okay? So, we will see how that happens. So, we are fortunate in one sense, but we cannot only rely on that process on the, on the spontaneous breakup of a liquid jet process. So, we need to do something more to achieve uh, even smaller droplets and that will be called atomization. So, so then the question as you see here, this is uh, what you am talking about that, that we need droplets from liquid jets. How does that happen? It essentially happens by two processes, liquid jet breakup and atomization. Now, I will uh, read this two paragraph because it is uh, important uh, that uh, it was discovered by Plato that the surface energy of a uniform circular cylindrical jet is not the minimum attainable for a given jet volume. Okay? So, he argued that the jet tends to break into segments of equal length, okay? uh, each of which is 2 pi times the jet radius. That means that it tends to form droplets. Okay? which is the of the which is which is equal to the circumference of the jet radius or or not not droplets it tends to break up into into segments and this length of these segments which it wants to break up is essentially equal to the circumference of the jet we will show why it is so okay such that spherical droplets are formed because once you break the jet up even if it was cylindrical or distorted cylinder uh, it, it, it immediately tends to form a uh, form a spherical drop from the segments uh, uh, because that gives it the minimum surface energy if a drop is formed from the segment. You know that, uh, that uh, when a liquid surface is formed then there is surface tension which essentially tries to minimize the surface energy and in trying to minimize the surface energy the drop it forms a spherical drop. Okay? And then uh, Rayleigh showed that the jet breakup is essentially the consequence of hydrodynamic instability which is called the Rayleigh Plato instability. And uh, if we neglect everything that is the ambient fluid, viscosity of the jet and gravity, he demonstrated that a circular cylindrical jet is unstable with respect to the disturbance of the wavelengths larger than the jet. And among all the unstable disturbances, the jet is most susceptible to disturbance with wavelengths which is 143.7 percent of its circumference. Now, where does this, it is uh, important for you to ask this question that where does this number 2 pi times larger than this jet radius? 1437 percent comes from. So, we will do the analysis of this liquid jet breakup uh, simplified analysis which will show you that why does a liquid jet breakup happens. But this is very very important this is fundamentally of course, uh, uh, of course you understand that in a, in a gas turbine in a combustor when you inject a liquid jet it is a very complicated process because you have a swirling flows you have a very high uh, pressure flow where the turbulence is very strong. But once again if you remove all these complexities and look into the very fundamental aspects uh, if you look into your kitchen um, uh, kitchen sink and you, you allow the, the uh, liquid uh, jet to emerge you will see that this jet initially stays a very laminar smooth jet but at the end after some time it develops some, uh, uh, some uh, distortion and eventually droplets are formed. Now, this is uh, what is called the rail plateau instability and we will we'll show that this is uh, this jet can break up even when there is no gravity. Okay? So, we will we'll do the analysis of this. And then you have atomization. Okay, this is also important because we cannot in the gas turbine combustor, we cannot rely on the liquid jet breakup uh, process itself and we cannot also because there is so much air around so the, uh, surrounding it swirling or in high flow, or high axial flow velocities, high tangential velocities that you have um, uh, a sufficiently large gas inertia force which is proportional to the gas density relative to the surface tension per unit area of the interficial area and the jet may generate um, that is what we want to say is that, uh, that if the uh, 
gas inertia force is large related to the surface tension force which is characterized by basically large Weber number uh, okay Weber, Weber, Weber number is, de is defined in terms of the gas density um, uh, this is this uh, this whole thing is uh, essentially um, called uh, Weber number okay and uh, the jet may generate uh, uh, generate the liquid gas interface droplets with diameters which is much smaller than its own diameter because you see here the droplet that will be formed is essentially of the order of the diameter okay, of the liquid jet okay but here when, when there is air uh, then the then the droplet that will be formed is can be much uh, smaller than uh, these things essentially the you can think of it like the droplet is being peeled off from the jet surface okay by forming ligaments etc which is essentially teared off from the uh, from the jet surface and they form in ligaments the stellar mode of jet breakup is called the so called atomization that leads to fine spray formation. So, essentially in the final jet that we have in a gas turbine engine that contains droplets of different sizes, it contains droplets a large population of droplets which are of the order of its uh, of, of the order of the jet diameter, it uh, contains droplets which are of the order of uh, the much smaller than the jet diameter and due to different processes that are being involved ok. So, this is how uh, an injector in a gas turbine engine essentially looks like uh, you see and uh, this is how the this atomization process happens. So, this is this is the injector this is the actual picture of the injector this is the uh, this is the mesh uh, and this is a simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you see that this injector uh, has different ports ok like this um, and uh, this uh, this uh, this liquid uh, uh, jet is uh, coming out and as you see that uh, here it uh, essentially uh, this this jet structure is maintained to some height and then it breaks up into different form of lig ligaments etc into various different shapes. So, it is a very complex process as you see, uh, but once again uh, this process is complex because the flow is also very complex. So, what we will do first is that we will take up this thing, uh, this can be analyzed ok. So, we will take up the analysis of this liquid jet breakup which is called the Rayleigh plate of instability. So, this uh, in this um, thing and this uh, we have done essentially if you remember we have done there are two parts that first you have to do the jet breakup and then once the jet is uh, jet breaks up you form droplets and this then droplets can evaporate and this can mix with the fuel uh, this this fuel can mix with the air and then you can burn it. Mm, but first the jet breakup process is important and then well, that is why we need to do it ok. So, here is another uh, uh, slide uh, before we go into the analysis here is another slide that shows you the different um, uh, the different uh, modes of how uh, these small droplets can be formed. So, this A is essentially this uh, this Rayleigh breakup where you see that this this laminar smooth jet is coming up uh, coming down where there is no disturbance and then after some after some time uh, small perturbations are essentially uh, gets amplified into this ok and then this uh, disturbance forms and then you see this uh, formation of these droplets which sometimes merge etc etc. And then there is a wind um, induced regime wind means as essentially the surrounding gaseous flow uh, this can be a wind induced regime this can be the second wind induced regime and this is like atomization where essentially it's very small droplets are peeled off from the from the mm, from the surface uh, of the liquid jet and uh, and uh, and very fine mist is formed. So, this is the primarily this uh, liquid jet breakup and this atomization are the two um, basic modes by which uh, uh, small droplets are formed, uh, but there are other more complex processes different breakup breakup mechanisms back breakup mechanism etcetera, but those we will not cover in this this uh, is outside the scope of this class and you should take a detailed course on uh, on uh, atomization uh, or sprays uh, mm -hmm. to understand that.